It's a warm day in July as you approach your building early in the morning. You are coming in early because your maintenance crew has told you that they're going to paint a particular classroom today and you want to make sure that everything has been removed. You walk down the hall toward the classroom and sure enough it appears that everything is out in the hall. You walk by a whiteboard, a smart board, bulletin boards, student desks and chairs, and many rolling carts of paper, teaching materials, textbooks, and so forth. <coughs> you walk into the classroom, and just before you do that, you turn and pick up a roll of tape off from a, ta a rolling cart, and you take it with you, and you open the door, walk across the room toward a wall. When you reach the wall, you pull out a, a banner that you've been carrying in your hand that's all rolled up, and you tape it to the wall. And then you step back and look at the banner. There's only one thing on the banner, and that is a Common Core State Standard. Just one, one standard. You then leave the room, and you go out, back out into the hall, and you pick up a student chair and you bring it back into the room and put it in the middle of the room. At that point, you begin to look at the banner and you look at the empty chair. And you consider the standard and you study it and you ask yourself, what are the prerequisite skills that a student would have to have in order to even approach this standard? And what are the new skills embedded in the standard? While you're doing all of that thinking, you hear a soft knock at the door. You know who it is because it's a student whom you invited to meet you here early this morning. And I would like to pause right now for just a minute and ask you to choose that student. I want you to choose a real student from your school. I want you to choose a student whose first and last name you know, whose face you know very well, you know what grade that student is going to be in next year, and you even know a little bit about that child's learning. And I'm going to give you just a few seconds to choose that child. <coughs> OK, you invite that child into the room and ask him or her to sit in the chair. The child does that, and you look back at the wall at that standard, and then you look at the student. You look at the standard, and you look at the student. And what you are doing is you are trying to form a visual image of what that child would be doing and saying, what you would be seeing and hearing if that child were performing mastery of that standard. And your mind begins to speed up, and it's working li lightning quick, and you are forming a plan, a, a plan about what kind of a learning environment you would have to create in order to bring that student to mastery. You excuse yourself, and you go out into the hall, and you begin to walk out the standard, literally. You walk down the hall. And you say, I'll take one of these, and one of these, and one of these. And in, over time, you return to the classroom. You have a bulletin board. You have some paper. You have some writing instruments. You might have a textbook. You probably have a student desk. And you bring all of that back into the classroom. You now, at this point, have the very essence, the nucleus, if you will, of standards-based education. You have in that room one educator, one student, one standard, one visual image of performance at the mastery level, one standards-based instructional plan, and one set of teaching materials and perhaps books. This, if you decide that you want to take your school to the point of being a standards-based learning en environment, this is the very essence of what you have to teach your teachers. Do not make the mistake of telling them that you're going, that altogether you're going to develop a 
program, a wall-to-wall -wall program. Standards-based instruction is not about designing a blanket that will float down over your building under which all kids will thrive. It is absolutely critical that you teach your teachers that this is where they begin because if, if your teacher cannot look you in the eye and name a student, name a standard, name a method, describe the performance at mastery level, explain how he or she is going to create the learning environment, if he can't do that on a one to one to one to one ratio, he can't do it. And don't make the mistake of thinking that if he multiplies that by 20, 25 students, that somehow magically it will happen. There are three big skills that you will have to train your teachers in if you want to become a standards-based teaching institution. The first one is you and your teachers all will have to become deeply familiar with the standards. And today I've been asked to speak directly to the Common Core and that's what I'll, I will do. So you need to become deeply familiar with how the Common Core is structured. It is a beautifully built system. It has components. We're, today we're going to talk about five of them. These components mesh together and the result is great strength. Your teachers need to get to the point, as do you, where you can talk about the different components and everybody knows where the conversation is going because you're that familiar with it. Your teachers will have to be taught how to build a standards-based instructional unit. When I was teaching and doing this back before we really talked about standards formally, uh, I like to have my units built two months before launch day. The reason for that was that during that two months between when I built it and when I launched it, it just took on a life of its own. And um, I was always so excited by launch day. I was positive that was going to be the best unit ever. <clears throat> and I would recommend that you ask your teachers to have all units built at least a month before uh, they launch. Clearly, I'm not suggesting today that you go down, go back to your buildings and suddenly announce that every teacher is going to do this, you know, from September to May, from morning till afternoon, and you, you can't do that. But anyway, at the point where they do begin, I really urge you to require that it be done well before launch day. When I uh, teach teachers how to do this, we go through 12 steps. That doesn't mean you have to. I like to just break them down because it's so important that the teachers um, know the correct sequence and perform the work in the correct sequence. The last big skill of the three, your teachers need to know how to build, how to construct and deconstruct a standards-based learning environment. I'll explain this a little more better later, but for right now, by learning environment, I'm talking about the walls, the floor, the, literally the traffic patterns, the footpaths that kids will take when they're in that unit the way the furniture is arranged, where the equipment is located, and how the teaching and learning materials are going to be made readily accessible. The teachers should divide the school year into segments and kind of chunk it. And within each chunk, they pre-plan um, to bring certain standards into the focus and it's around those standards. Those standards dictate the, how the learning environment is constructed. <clears throat> now, we come down to who. Who has to know all of this? Some years ago, I approached Michigan State University's School of Education asking to be admitted as a doctoral candidate for one purpose only. I wanted to do formal research of an intriguing question. The question was, why is it that so often 
an outside consultant comes into a district or a building, lots of enthusiasm, sometimes a lot of money spent, hard work completed, the consultant leaves, and within a fairly short time, it all goes flat. So Michigan State agreed, and I began my research. I gathered a study population together of consultants who were known to be among the very best. I wanted to look at the winners and find out how they did it. My study population lived every place from New York City to the Mississippi River, but they worked all over the nation. I interviewed them on paper, I interviewed them in person, I traveled with them, I shadowed, I observed, I recorded their words while they were at work, I did follow-up emails and phone calls, and I kept digging and digging and digging, trying to find out what the truth of their work was. Sadly, I have to report that they were as frustrated as some of the not-so-successful consultants had been that caused me to come to the research in the beginning. One of them had been invited by an entire New York, or an entire New England state to come in with great fanfare. School districts and public and buildings had to compete to get her to even darken their door. She came in for an entire year, many thousands of dollars were spent, and she told me herself that not long after it was all over, it had come to nothing, and she was very, very disappointed. And remember, I was talking to the cream of the crop. So I kept asking why and who. Without one single exception, they all came around to lay the responsibility at one place. And I expect you know where. It's you, the school leaders. They told me stories about launching a training and having the school principal come in and introduce them and leave, never to be seen again. Or the school principal would introduce them and sit down as if he or she were going to take part. Cell phone would go off, they would drift out in the hall to take the call, and were never seen again. Now, obviously, if I asked you what is the result, we could all say, well, that sends a signal to the teachers that, yeah, it's important for you guys, but it's not so important that it should touch me. You know, that is so obvious that we don't, I think, have to spend any time there. The real problem, the real weakness that that behavior generated in the, according to these cons consultants in my study population, was that the principal never became a learner and really, became, you know, as far as an amount of knowledge of the initiative was under the teachers. The principal could not ask intelligent questions. And more importantly, the principal couldn't discern whether the teacher who was answering his questions really knew what he or she was talking about. Standards-based education is all about accountability. And you cannot hold your teachers to accountability if you are not extremely knowledgeable about it yourself. So the question becomes, how do you make that happen? Because in the midst of everything else that you have to know about, how do you pull this off? The answer is that you, you adopt the role of learner. I would like you for a minute to imagine your building, the front door, imagine a great big sign over top of the door with neon lights blinking, and it says at, put in your school name, everyone is a learner. Everyone really does mean everyone. And it completely lets you off the hook. All you have to do is give it the time. If you are a learner, then you don't have to be the most knowledgeable person in the building about Common Core or standards-based education. You are totally free to say to your teachers, 
I'm confused at this point, or this is overwhelming, or I don't remember what was said, what we're supposed to do next. Do you? I think this is right, but I'm not positive. Can somebody help me out? You know, you can say all of that, and when you do that, then you are modeling in front of your teachers that professionally, it's quite all right for them to say those things. Nobody is going to be judging them professionally because they didn't or don't know. You are all learning. And that is why it is so absolutely critical that if you do take the step to take your staff into standards-based education, then do it as a co-learner. Do it as a co-learner for you. Do it as a co-learner for them so that nobody has to feel brilliant about this on day one. So what is it that you all need to learn? Well, regarding Common Core, there are five components that you need to be aware of. And it isn't enough just to learn the five components. What you really want to do is learn how they mesh together. Because when you blend them together, you will discover that they are very, very strong. So we're going to just take a very brief look at these. Now, don't expect to walk out of here having memorized it. It's totally not necessary to try to memorize today. I just, in the time I have, all I want to do is just to give you a feeling for both the complexity of the, the whole system and also the reasonable way that they were put together and maybe get in a kind of a glimmer of why it, it can work so well. The first component I want you to tell you about is called Standards for Mathematical Practice. This has nothing to do with what a second grader needs to learn in math as opposed to what a third grader needs to learn. It's not about content. Instead, they are eight, only eight, eight statements that are good from kindergarten to 12th grade. If a, 12, if a kindergarten teacher is reading hers, her words will be absolutely identical to what a 12th grade teacher would be reading. They are general overarching statements about what a college and career ready student of mathematics understands about the practice of math. And when you hear me say today college and career ready, and I'm talking sometimes kindergarten, first grade, that just means on the 13 year continuum, they're right where they need to be with the prediction that by the end of 12th grade, they will be ready to step out into college or career. OK, the next big of the uh, component of the five is the grade level standards for mathematical content. Now notice, this one ends in the word practice. This ends in the word content. And that is the difference between them. Practice is how we function as a, stu a student of mathematics. Content is what we need to learn at each grade. So there are many, many content standards, but only eight practice standards. Then we have the English language arts capacities, the third of the five components. English language arts capacities mirrors the math standards of practice, except of obviously they're about ELA, and there are only seven of them. Once again, they're good to go from K to 12, and they just describe the college and career-ready student what kind of an approach do they take toward reading, writing, speaking, and listening um, if they are right where they need to be on the continuum toward being college and career ready. And then, as before, we have our grade level standards for English language content. And now we go, now we change it up as we move from grade to grade to grade. And of course, there are many more uh, of those. The last one. Component number five is, in my opinion, extremely exciting. I cannot tell you how pleased I was when I learned back in 2010 that the authors of the Common Core had put these in. They, it, as you see here, it's literacy standards for middle school and high school. 
the explanation by the authors was that elementary teachers are already doing this. I'm not sure that I, I mean, I agree they do it, but I really kind of wish they had been written for elementary. But nevertheless, this is what we have. They are very challenging. They are general statements about how a middle school and high school student should function in their non-English courses. In other words, in math, in science, in history, in social studies, and so forth. <laughs> how they should be reading, how they should be writing. We'll talk in a little more detail about those in just a minute. So now we're going to take a little uh, deeper look at standards of mathematical practice. As I said before, you're good, K K-12. No change up. I'm just going to quit talking and let you read these as they come up on the screen. And there they are. I should mention to you that I only wrote the titles or the first words of each one. Actually, they are mini paragraphs. And they give you a nice, clear picture of what that type of math student looks like when they're doing math. Now, the grade level standards for mathematical content are completely different. They are divided into two large segments. You have your K-8 and you have your 9-12. In K-8, you begin with domains, then you go to clusters, and then you go to standards. And here are the domains. I'll give you just a minute to run your eye down that list. So all K-8 math, every single standard, fits one of those categories. Under each domain name, you will find a few clusters. Clusters are really handy. I'm very glad that the authors put those in because they're descriptive. Just by reading a cluster name, you can automatically tell what kind of standards you're going to find underneath it. All grades do not get all domains. Counting and cardinality falls by the wayside very quickly. You know, you're not teaching a fourth grader how to count. All grades do not get every cluster. And even if three or four grades do get a cluster, obviously the bottom level standards will be different because then now you're right down to the nitty gritty what a second grader should do as opposed to what a fourth grader should do. Then we have grades 9 to 12. 9 to 12 is quite different. They add on another level because you know when you talk about high school math, you don't usually talk about 10th grade math. You talk about geometry or algebra 2 or whatever is happening in your building. So they begin with a course or conceptual con concept, then come the domains, then come the clusters, and then come the standards. And these are the domains. OK, now we're going to move on to those English language arts capacities. Remember, again, they're good for K-12. And I'll be quiet while you read the, these as they come up. And there you have them. And oops, once again, 
uh, keep in mind that these are only the titles. They're really our paragraphs that describe um, what a college and career ready student looks like when they are performing at the correct level of these. Then we have our grade level, English language arts standards, where we are really are talking about what each grade needs to learn. ELA standards are divided into four groups called strands. There's reading, writing, speaking and listening, language. As an English major, language just warms my heart. I was so, so glad when I saw that this was in here. Language is capitalization, punctuation, grammar. So with Common Core, America has fortunately pulled back from those unfortunate decades where teachers were taught that you cannot put a red mark on a paper because it'll ruin a kid's creativity for life. And all they had to do was write in their journals every day and somehow magically they would learn to, I, I'm seeing smiles all over the room, you guys nod in your heads, I love that. Um, anyway, we know that when you get out in the real world and you're writing a memo to uh, your team, you, you know, you're at work and you know that you, you really need to know and want to know how to capitalize and punctuate and use verbs and all of that. So I'm just so, so happy that it is in there. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel like when I read the Common Core that um, the people that wrote them took a great big common sense pill before they started because they just seem practical. They seem, as I read them, they seem like real life, like of course we want our kids to know that. You know, frankly, I have to tell you that when I read them, it kind of takes me back to my days as a student. I feel like maybe now in America we're going to be educating like I was educated, and I think that was pretty good. <laughs> anyway, they, in many ways they seem traditional and very functional to me. They have a unique uh, character about them, and it's called anchors. Anchors, once again, are not what a student in a certain grade has to learn. They are uh, standards that tie a whole school all together. There are only 10 reading anchors. And it doesn't matter what grade the student is in, all the way from kindergarten through high school, every teacher that's teaching ELA is going to be looking at the same 10 reading anchors. There are only 10 writing anchors. There are six speaking and listening and six language. So altogether, there are only 32 anchors. The beauty of the anchor system is that you can pull your staff into a training session and you can say, today we're going to work on writing anchor number four and everybody's with you. It doesn't matter what grade they really teach. They can talk to each other and give each other ideas because the anchor has the very same wording. Now you may have also heard that when it comes to reading standards, each grade level we, in America now with the Common Core, for those who adopt it, will have standards for reading literature and standards for reading for information. Because of that, every grade gets 20 anchors. But those 20 anchors all grow out of the original 10 reading anchors. Every grade has exactly 10 writing standards. And it's a perfect one-to-one -one match. In eighth grade, standard, writing standard number two goes right back to anchor number two. And I could say that for every grade. And that is why it is going to be so easy for you to bring your multi-grade staff together and say, today we're going to work on writing anchor number two. And every teacher knows the anchor, and they know the little difference grade by grade uh, of how, you know, what they have to do specifically in their grade. There are exactly six speaking and listening at, uh, standards at grade level, and there are exactly six language standards at grade level. So you have a perfect one-to-one -one match. It's 
So all together, with just a few exceptions, you get 42 standards, ELA standards per grade. Now, sometimes there is an exception because it will say um, this anchor doesn't begin at this grade. Like sometimes it's too complex for K or 1, you know, something like that. But pretty much 42 per grade. And this is what it looks like. The L means that this is a language standard. This standard has something to do with punctuation, grammar, like I said. CCRA, College and Career Ready Anchor. You'll find that in the middle. Every time you see that in the middle of a code, you know you're looking not at a grade specific, but at an anchor. And this is number three. Now watch what happens. Out of that one anchor grows all of these. See all of the L's in front? That's because we're all on language. See how in the middle it changes? Starts with a K, K123. That's because we're changing grades. Notice down at the bottom, we do not have 9, 10, 11, 12. We have 9, 10 band, 11, 12 band. You'll find that a lot in the Common Core. Then we have the three out at the end because they're all outgrowths of anchor number three. And this right here is why you can have some very strong multi-staff training sessions because you're all going to be talking the same language. And that, that wasn't a pun. <laughs> okay, now we come to uh, the one I said I was so excited about when I first became familiar with the Common Core, the literacy standards for grades 6 to 12. These come in three distinct groups, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So grade 7 is identical to grade 6 and grade 8. They come in two chunks, literacy for history or social studies, literacy for science and technical subjects. There are two kinds, reading in each group, and writing. Now the reading is separated out. The writing is across the board. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say to you that probably the screen you're looking at right now represents the greatest challenge to you as a leader if you decide to adopt the Common Core. The reason I say that is that many math and science, technology teachers, and even some history and social studies teachers, when they went to college and aimed toward a degree, they thought they were going to be able to just focus on teaching their content. That is what, definitely what they were told. You know, that was their purpose in life, was to teach that content. Probably nobody warned them that you might have to teach kids how to read in your subject area as opposed to how they should read in another subject area. And they may not have been warned that you're going to have to teach students how to write as a scientist or as a mathematician, as a historian. So it may not be a strong area for your teachers, and now they have to turn around and teach it. If you sense that happening among your staff, I recommend to you don't, don't go it alone. Don't try to stand up in front of them and be this person that somehow is so knowledgeable about all this yourself. Call on the colleagues on your staff who can help out. Your English teacher probably can meet with colleagues during professional learning communities meetings or whatever you call them and give some pointers. Don't even hesitate to go to your elementary staff. If you have an elementary teacher who's known to be a very good teacher of reading or writing, bring that person to meetings and they will have ideas and they will probably even be happy to mentor some of your other teachers. Just, you know, get the need right out there on the table and uh, let everybody talk about it freely. This is new, this is challenging, never had to do it before, and let's learn how to do it together. 
This is really uh, quite a change uh, in, in our curriculum and it, uh, it's going to be good for kids because it's going to help send kids out into college and into their careers better able to function uh, in, their, in their careers. Now, I have just said a lot to you and I've shown you a lot and you may be thinking, oh man, how do we pull this off? And then she was talking about setting up these learning environments and, and having chunks in the year and if we only have a few chunks in the year, how do we accomplish all of it? Well, the answer to that is by just thinking of it as layers. Kind of like, uh, I don't know, making a cake, I guess, with layers. You can teach your teachers how to think of the standards as focus standards and tool standards. Tool standards contain skills that students perfect by practicing on focus content. So in the very same weeks of the year that they are learning content, they can be doing that in the context of practicing other standards. And that's why you can have multiple standards going on in every single chunk of the year. And within one learning environment, it can all be working together. For example, Suppose that the teacher chooses a speaking and listening skill, a speaking and listening standard for her tool standard. And this could be elementary all the way up through high school. So on day one, the room might look like some kind of a speaking auditorium or some kind of a speaking venue. You might have student desks in a U, you might have a table across the front or a podium. Maybe she's decided to uh, focus on debates or formal discussions. You might have some equipment there that the kids can uh, videotape themselves and play it back. You have the content materials, the textbooks, and whatever is needed for learning the content. And then all day long, 8.30 to 3.30, whatever, those um, same tool standards are operating. So during that chunk of time, whether the kids are learning science or history or math or whatever, they know that they are going to be learning by listening to their peers talk about the content and periodically they're going to be called upon to get up and deliver knowledge of content through speaking and listening. Even at the high school level, get the room set up once, all of your classes come and go all day long, but they all know during these two weeks we're going to be receiving and delivering content knowledge through speaking. Now another time the tool standard might be some kind of writing, some focused kind of reading. But you can see that at the end of that kind of immersion, those kids will have moved a long way toward mastery of that particular skill. And that's why it becomes doable. This continues from launch day to wrap day. Launch day, the pre-launch, is when the kids help you set up the new environment. And just in making the decisions about how to arrange the furniture and what to do with the walls, talking with you and among themselves, they are beginning to anticipate the kind of skill that they're going to have to master. And then on wrap day, they pack it away and you put away what you're going to want to use a year from now and <clears throat> that brings closure to the unit. So a learning environment is all about the teacher using time, using her space, using tools to bring students to mastery of a very well clarified set of standards. There's, there's no doubt, there needs to be no doubt on the part of any student, anybody walking into the room, what we're working on right now. Now this brings us to the point of saying, well, what do we do if it all just begins to feel overwhelming, too much. 
My answer to you, my suggestion to you, is that you help your teachers feel as if they own the Common Core. It is not a monster that is in control of them. You can tiptoe your way in if you want to. It, it's not your, that you have to be this or that. You can just begin to work your way into it. And if you choose not to go with Common Core, then whatever standard system you're working with, teachers should feel like they own it. They should talk it, touch it, sort, group, prioritize, sequence, manage it. And I, to give you a feeling for what I mean, and what I feel is one of the best ways to do this, I brought along some envelopes. Inside, you're each going to get an envelope, and inside each envelope there are some little colored papers. Each color represents a different component that I described to you. In, in a very short amount of time, we're just going to play at this, uh, and believe me, I did not begin to bring you a complete set of anything. I want you to just lay these out on the table in front of you, kind of sort them by color, and then begin to, to look at them and ask yourself, which of these might I like to put together into one instructional unit? Which ones could my students be working on, working toward mastery of within one learning environment, within one chunk of a school year? There's no right or wrong. It's strictly a matter of opinion. It doesn't matter what the person next to you, how they arrange their papers. Let's just do this for just a few minutes, and then we'll uh, Move on. See, if I could have some help maybe from some of you. Um, one to each person. One to each person. I'm not going to talk while you do this. I would just like you to have a little bit of time to think about it on your own. Uh huh. Thank you. Yep. Okay, does, ever, does everybody have one? As you do this little kind of pretend activity, imagine yourself, imagine your teacher is doing this. Oh, two more. Okay. Oh, yep. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. As soon as you become somewhat familiar with the language, you might try to pick out a tool standard. What is the one skill that students would be practicing all day long, and which ones might be the focus standards, the content that they would be learning while they are doing your tool skill? 
Remember that it is the tool skill, the tool standard that would dictate how you would design the classroom for that chunk of the school year. That tool standard will di dictate how you arrange the furniture, what you do with your walls, how you use technology. The content will be more likely to control the textbooks and teaching materials that you want to have accessible to the kids. We'll spend about another four minutes. When you make your decision, if you would like to turn and share with a neighbor, feel free to. end here in about three minutes or end the activity in three and then I had a little two minute wrap up but I don't have to do that. If, is that okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, we, time is uh, saying that we probably need to put these back in the envelopes. And by the way, I have more of those, so if you want to take anything home, um, maybe somebody that was in the other session or whatever, feel free to ask me afterward. <clears throat> As you're putting those away, I would like to wrap up by turning your thoughts toward one last concept called moral imagination. Moral imagination describes one of your most profound responsibilities as a leader. If you decide to take your teachers into standards-based instruction, whether that is common core or not, moral imagination is the, the process of first recognizing what's happening within yourself. If you are a completely normal person, the thought of something very new, especially when it's complex, brings on a bit of anxiety. You might have sensed a little bit of that anxiety even as you heard me talk today because I, in a very short amount of time, have thrown out a lot. And you now, if you didn't know before, you now see that Common Core is big. I think it's strong and good, but it's big, it's complex, and that can breed some anxiety. 
But being a leader, as you are, you will work your way through that in your own quiet time, long before you have even mentioned to your staff that you might be planning to go this route, you will work your way through that. You will get a hold of yourself and you will say, well, of course we can do this. We just have to break it down into segments. We'll just conquer one piece at a time. We'll just inch into it. Nobody's holding a club over our head. We will set our timeline. Yep, we can do this. At, it's at that point that moral imagination really kicks in. Because now you, as a leader, have a responsibility to quietly, when you are alone, begin to think about your individual teachers. Do you remember, back before, when I first began to talk, I asked you to choose one student. And we had that one student sitting in one chair in the middle of that room. And I told you way back then that you should not make the mistake of thinking big program, but you needed to focus and make your teachers focus on one student. It's in the work with one student that accountability, accountability really happens. Nothing can escape if you are questioning a teacher, why are you doing it the way you're doing Talk to me about that student and convince me that what you're doing is going to bring that student to mastery. Then you can do your multiplication times as many kids as you have in the room. Well, you know what? The very same thing is true for you. You need to pick one teacher, one teacher, one teacher. Think about one at a time, and you need to contemplate that teacher's confidence level, what scares them, are they perhaps the over-eager one that might jump ahead of you and need to be reined back? What is, predictably, what is going to happen one teacher at a time? Then you are morally obligated to preempt that and to have a plan. Not a staff-wide plan, a teacher-by-teacher-by-teacher teacher teacher plan so that no teacher has a terrible experience and you can bring them along together in unique and varied ways to the point where they are confident and ready to get on board with the initiative. So that is the last thought I want to leave with you and I hope you don't feel like I covered too much too fast tried not to do that, but you know when you're talking Common Core and you're enthusiastic, um, it's hard not to do that. But I wish you the very best. Uh, whether you choose Common Core, whether you choose standards-based, um, I hope you have a wonderful year. If you want to talk further, if you have more questions, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch and um, I just hope you have a wonderful year. Thanks. <laughs>